an example having to do with this, but we're going to put some different numbers on it and approach it slightly differently. We're going to have a force applied to the system, which is equal to 6.0 newtons. The mass of the object is 1.5 kilograms. And we're going to have two givens for the coefficients of friction. We're going to say that the coefficient of kinetic friction between the book and the surface is 0.22. And the coefficient of static friction between the book and the surface is 0.40. I have two questions. First, does the book move? And second, what is the acceleration of the book? Clearly, if it doesn't move, we can stop because the acceleration would be equal to zero. We are going to draw the free body diagram. The free body diagram is going to be the same almost as it was before. We still have the force of gravity. We still have the force normal. We still have the force applied. And we still have a force of friction. The difference here is we don't know if it moves or not. So we don't know whether we have static or kinetic friction. So at this point, I'm just putting the force of friction. We don't know if it moves or not. Last time, we went through a five-step process on how to deal with problems that have forces. We will review now. Class, what was step one? Thank you, Ian. Step two. Victoria, what was step two? Break forces into components. We will start over. Class, what was step one? <laughs> After you draw the free body diagram, step two? Break forces into components. Step three? Redraw the free body diagram. Step four? Sum the forces. Step five? So remember, steps four and five sound very similar. There's some of the forces in one direction. Step five is some of the forces in the other direction. So we're now going to work through that. So we've done step one, we've drawn the free body diagram. Please tell me which forces need to be broken into their components, Emily X. Who wants to help her out? Emily C. The answer is none, correct, because they're all either already in the x or the y direction. So in this particular case, we actually don't need to break anything into components. We don't need to redraw the free body diagram. It's not a very fair question, but it's a good one nonetheless. So we can actually skip step steps two and three because there's nothing to break into components. So now we're going to sum the forces. Please pick a direction to sum the forces in, Andrea, and do so. Some forces in the x direction, which is forces in the x direction is equal to force applied uh, minus force of friction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. Great. So we have the net force in the x direction, which is force applied minus force of friction, which equals mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Now. The first thing we're trying to do here is to decide, figure out if it moves or not. In order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in the maximum force of static friction for the force of, or for the force of friction to figure out if it moves. So this step is to figure out if it moves. The force of static friction maximum we're plugging in for the force of friction. Okay. What then can we plug in for the force of static friction maximum. Um, who? Okay, now, this is important to hear and understand, and I'm going to say, Hoover, thank you very much for making this mistake, because this is a classic mistake. It's a good one to make, so that we cannot make it again. The question I asked is, what are we going to plug in for the force of static friction, Hoover said? 0.4. Who can tell me what his mistake is? It's important to understand what this is. It's a common one. Stuart? Is the difference between the force of static friction and the maximum force of static friction? Uh, not quite, but, but you're getting that. It's not quite correct. Uh, your Trishan? 
Uh, it's the, that's the coefficient of static friction. So often people confuse the force of friction with the coefficient of friction. I asked you what are we going to plug in for the force of static friction, you gave me the coefficient of static friction. They're two separate things, so you have to be really careful. What are we going to put in for the force of static friction, Nate? The maximum? Yes, well, maximum force of static friction. Ah, no, that, that would be the force applied. It's okay, that's the force applied. We'll uh, get there uh, in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, 0.4 times force over Well, without your numbers dependency, yes. So we have mu s times force normal. I like to deal with, num with letters rather than numbers. I agree. So for the force of static friction maximum, we have an equation which is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the force normal. So who do you see the difference? Okay, so it's an important one. The difference between the force and the coefficient. So we now have the force applied minus the coefficient of static friction times force normal is equal to mass times the acceleration in the x direction. We don't really have anywhere we can go with this at the moment, Eric. Um, is force static friction max coordinates, or was that just the, the um... That was just an example we were doing before. Oh, that was, yeah, that was just a hypothetical example up here where we moved on. Okay. I, don't have anywhere to go. Sam? Um, I would sum the forces in the other direction. What should we do with this? Put this in our holster. We're going to put this in our equation holster. We're going to hold it there until it's, we can find something to do with it. Because right now, we know the force applied, but we don't know the force normal. So, and we don't know the acceleration. So there are two things in here we don't know. So yes, we'll switch to the other direction. We'll sum the forces in the y direction. Looking at the free body diagram, please sum of the forces in the y direction. Queen? Um, force um, in the y direction equals, oh, uh, force normal. Uh, can't remember if it's plus or minus the force of gravity. Okay, we'll just do this for now. Okay. We'll figure it out, keep going. I don't really know what to do there. Okay, well the net force is always equal to something according to Newton's second law. Oh, equals um, mass times the gravity, mass times gravity? Ah, it's not equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. That's not quite correct. Uh, help us out here, Nate. The mass of the acceleration in the y direction. Mass times the acceleration in the y direction of the object. And is it plus or minus, Stuart? Minus. Because? The force normal is up, so it's positive. The force of gravity is down, so it's negative. What is the acceleration in the y direction of the book in this case? Um, 9.8. The acceleration? Uh, no. Uh, okay. In the y, oh, it's zero. Okay. It's not in free fall, right? So it's right. not 9.8. But we don't know if it moves or not. So I don't understand how you can say that the acceleration in the y direction is equal to zero. Yes, that leads to it, but I need more than that. Who wants to help her out? Chad is. We know if it, if it moves, it's going to move left or right because of the surface, so it's not going to move up or down. So in this particular case, because of the surface, it's not going to move up or down if it does move. So therefore, the acceleration of y direction equals zero. Therefore, force normal minus the force of gravity equals zero. So force normal equals the force of gravity which equals what? What is the equation for the force of gravity? George? Mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Great. Mass times the acceleration due to gravity. What now? Um, Andrew? Um, I'd substitute in 4m, which is 1. Did you start plugging in numbers? Yeah. You're, yeah. See, you guys love your numbers. You do. You're a big fan of numbers. Uh, at this point, we certainly could, but I, that's not what I would do. I would do one more step first. What would be the step that I would do first in the long run? This is probably best for you, Eric. Um, would you substitute force normal into the first x direction? Going back to the, yeah. <clears throat> Andrew, what is this? That's our host. In our equation holster, we have a force normal, so we could substitute into the equation which we have in our equation holster. We get force applied minus mu s times mass times the acceleration of gravity equals mass times the acceleration in the x direction. 
now I would substitute in numbers, Andrew. You guys have a tendency to want to substitute in numbers as soon as you can. I try to hold you back in the long run. It's better for you in your physics lives. So we now have enough where we actually can solve to see if it moves or not. So let's do so. Let's plug in all the numbers. The force applied is 6 minus the coefficient of static friction, which was one of our givens, at 0 0.4 times the mass, which was one of our given, 1.5, the acceleration due to gravity here on planet Earth, which is 9.8, and yes, it's positive, and yes, I am positive about that. It equals the mass, which is 1.5, times the acceleration, which we do not know. This actually gives us the answer to our question. We just need to multiply through 0.4 times 1.5 times 9.8, and then understand what's going on. Five point eight. Five point eight. Okay. This actually answers our question as to whether it moves or not. I need somebody to tell me how it is that we know the answer now. Does it move, Aaron? We know it does move because the force applied is greater than. What I'm going to say is yes, you're correct, and yes, that's true for this specific instance, but I want to give a more general answer. So yes, in this particular case, what's going on, we know it moves because the force applied, which is 6 newtons, is greater than the maximum force of static friction. So in this particular case, it moves. What I'm going to say is subtly different is yes, it moves because the acceleration in the x direction is greater than 0. You can see if we take 6 minus 5.8, we're going to get something to confirm the acceleration in the x direction, which is greater than 0. Matt? Could the acceleration in the x direction actually be negative? Would it just be moving? So let's, let's think about what would happen. What would it mean if we got an acceleration that was negative in this particular case? What would that mean, Sam? That would mean the static friction is greater than the force applied? That would mean the maximum force of static friction is greater than the force applied. So would it move? It would move. It would move. That. Hold up. So would it move this way if I were to push on it with not enough force? Yeah. Nate? No, because well, I mean, it the friction, but resist. Remember, we used the maximum force of static friction. The force of static friction adjusts to prevent the object from moving. So if we got a negative acceleration in this case, it would simply mean that it's not moving. Because it's not going to move in the direction of the force of static friction. So to review. In this particular case, because the force applied was greater than the for maximum force of static friction, it moves because that means the acceleration is greater than zero. Okay, how do we then figure out the acceleration in the x direction? Um, Owen? In the x direction? Yes, if we're trying to figure out the acceleration. Yeah. Or you can just 6 minus 5.88. Oops. Okay. And divide by 1.5. So take this equation and divide by the 1.5. What do we get for the acceleration in the x direction, please? 0 0.08. I believe that works out to be exactly 0.08, so I'll add one sig fig on it and get that for our answer. And it's important to understand that that is not correct. It seems like it would be. I agree. And the majority of you looked at that and said, sure, that makes sense. But it's not right. Got to understand why. Eric? I'm not sure about this having no direction. It doesn't have to do with the direction. It would be the acceleration in the x direction. It would be positive. It would be giving you the direction. Stuart? Remember, what we were doing here is we're figuring out does it move or not. So we used the maximum force of static friction. We determined it's moving. So do we have static friction? Class, do we have static no, friction? No, no. no, we have kinetic friction. So what we have to do is go back to the step where we plugged in the force of static friction and instead plug in the force of kinetic friction. So we come back to here and we get the net force in the x direction equals the force applied minus the force of kinetic friction, which equals mass times the acceleration in the x direction. 
What are we going to substitute in Christine for the force of kinetic friction? I'm sorry, is it the what? This is good. The coefficient of kinetic friction, yes. Using the terms is so important. I understand the coefficient of kinetic friction. It's okay. Help her out. Uh, your tissue. Um, it's the, the kinetic friction coefficients times the force normal. We have force kinetic friction equals mu k times force normal, or the coefficient of kinetic friction times force normal, which we could substitute in for the force of kinetic friction. Negative mu k times force normal equals mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Again, we have force normal is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity, so we can substitute that in. Force applied minus mu k times m times g equals the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. We have all of these numbers. We can now solve for the acceleration in the x direction. In fact, you'll discover that this looks very much like what we did before, only instead of using the coefficient of static friction, we are using the coefficient of kinetic friction, which again was a given, the coefficient of kinetic friction at 0 0.22. So the acceleration in the x direction just ends up being equal to 6 minus 0 0.22 times 1.5 times 9.8 divided by 1.5. So with sig figs, 1.8 meters per second squared. So again, we figured out if it was moving using static friction, the maximum force of static friction. But once we determined it was moving, we had to then switch to kinetic friction.